Hey everyone, Al Fragnoli, Zach Sudi, legal leaders. We're joined this morning by Norm Schimmel. Norm is uh, an ex CEO of public and private domestic and international businesses and a very avid uh, sports uh, fan. And he's spent a lot of time working um, around various sports teams. Norm, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. We've got a couple questions lined up for you. The first one we want to start with is you were uh, born in Brooklyn, spent a lot of time living in Manhattan, so you're familiar with uh, the New York City area. Um, talk about what it was like growing up in Brooklyn and, and being an avid Brooklyn Dodgers fan. Well, it, it was probably um, the best childhood ever um, up until uh, 1957. Um, and uh, it was a different type of childhood, but they were not only a team, they were the entire borough. As a matter of fact, in 57, when they left, the borough changed. But one of the things, as an example, if you're a Brooklyn Dodger fan, there is a Brooklyn Dodger Historical Society that is live and, and on Facebook if you go into it. And you'd be very, very interested, of course, a lot of the people of my age, on how we continue to be Brooklyn Dodger fans. And by the way, my email address, my telephone, my license still has a four for Duke Snyder, always and uh, always my favorite player, but they were more than a team. And as far as civil rights was concerned, uh, the, the borough of Brooklyn was 25 years ahead of Martin Luther King because of the team and what they did. In 57, when they left, um, uh, trying to keep guns away from Walter O'Malley and Robert Moses, who was our parks director. And by the way, it was Robert Moses, the parks director, that caused the team to leave, even, even if it was McNa uh, 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 the Dodgers O'Malley uh, thought about going into cable TV and stuff like that. But you never stop being a Brooklyn Dodger fan. I'm gonna say one last thing to you too. Um, the Cubs in the World Series, every Brooklyn Dodger fan who's still alive was rooting for the Cubs because we could relate so much, simple as that. And 1955 uh, is, our, is our golden year and we stay with it. That's great, Norm. Um, so you played some amateur ball with some very recognizable names, including Joe Torrey. Tell, tell us a little bit about your ex experience in amateur ball. Well, I, I really wanted to be a ball player. My, my oldest brother, uh, uh, 1948 uh, Celtics training camp. Uh, he was a very big name in New York at a high school named uh, Boys High. That's how you go green and, and uh, Calvin Murphy, a variety of people who you know came out of. So I, I came out of a jock family. Unfortunately, I did a Rota Cup, but in the same league that Joe Torre, who was my age, Rico uh, Petroselli was about three years younger, it produced players like Tommy Davis, uh, Koufax, and a variety of other people all in Brooklyn. It was the hotbed of baseball, but I really intended to have a pro career and uh, almost got it, uh, but, uh, but a, a Rota Cup and there was no medical uh, to cure that at that point, ended that. And so I went into business and naturally I was uh, uh, leaning towards sports in college. Uh, and um, my first job was as the sporting goods buyer for Abraham and Strauss, uh, which is the Federated Department Store Jail, Hudson, you know, they're all in the same Bloomingdale. So I was the sporting goods buyer and I was recruited out of that by AMF to run a company called Boyd. And every basketball you ever bounced was Boyd. We were making Wilson's ball too, and and uh, that got me deep into it, and and I stayed with it, and some lifelong friends like Willis Reed and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, the amateur baseball in Brooklyn at that time was top notch, was absolutely top notch. And again, I'm leaving out a lot of names, and I'm I'm sorry to do that, but uh, but it was wonderful. Uh, it became even more important after the uh, after the Dodgers left, and. Uh, um, you know, you, uh, when, when, when Joe comes around, he goes to every spring training uh, facility uh, in the spring and we'll spend five minutes recounting all those things. And of course, Rico managed here. Rico managed here when the Red Sox had a farm team here for one year. That's I, awesome. I, I, That's became, awesome. I became pretty close at that time also with the Baltimore Orioles organization. So you, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, the boy basketballs, but you also helped develop and market the first metal tennis racket. Tell us a little bit about that process. I, I, uh, uh, I ran Void and, and also was involved in the acquisitions. Uh, AMF, everybody thinks about bowling alleys, but they're a large conglomerate. So while running AMF, uh, I was involved in the acquisitions of, uh, they owned uh, 
the Alcourt, which you know as the Sunfish and the Sailfish, the acquisition of Harley Davidson, the acquisition of Head for the 360 ski and uh, tennis racket at that time, and then the Ben Hogan Company. Um, I was re uh, and, and some interesting trivia, which you don't have time for about AMF now, but uh, when we acquired Head, Howard Head was of course let go and he moved down to Maryland and started a company called Prince. And they did something very interesting. They enlarged the size of a racket. So uh, AMF told him he didn't know what he was doing. And he also told Bill Davidson that he didn't know what he was doing and he almost took a chapter 11. Uh, I was recruited out of, uh, I was recruited out of uh, AMF after eight years by Tenger, who was a lighting company, but the uh, chairman of the board, American Exchange, chairman of the board was an avid tennis player. And so um, uh, here's your trivia for you now. Um, the first metal tennis rackets that we used were in France, uh, the French Davis Cup team, because that metal tennis racket was developed by a man named Rene Lacoste. Rene Lacoste, Le Alligator. And people don't know this, okay? Wilson bought the rights to uh, bring them into the United States. But Jay had started on a metal tennis racket way before they arrived in the United States. And by the way, Williams, uh, uh, Wilson sold tons of them. Their racket was a trampoline racket, which, which had wire around the rim and the, and the string would go into the wires around the rim. The tensor steel or tensor aluminum had wires in a frame, just like a wooden racket. So the joke in the industry was the only person who could keep a, ten, a Wilson racket between the lines was Jimmy Connors because the thing, because of the way it's strung, you could never really control it. So that was the joke in the industry. They, 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 they sold millions of them, but the tenter construction and then, then a company called Chemmold, uh, we presented it on and uh, the rest is history. After the steel racket came the aluminum racket after the aluminum racket came Howard Head, who did the oversized Prince racket, and, and then you have a composite afterwards. But I spent a lot of time at Forest Tills. I spent a lot of time initially in the U.S. Tennis Center, and I arrived in Florida with the racket uh, to meet Nick Volateri, who at that time was at the Colony Beach Club. IMG had not been uh, uh, established at that time, and I came down here to show him and demonstrate with our sales force the metal tennis racket, and that's how I found Sarasota. By the way, the colony at that time, number one tennis resort in the United States, everybody whose name you could name was there. You could see them. That's incredible. That's awesome. Um, speaking about uh, Sarasota here, as we go in, uh, into this um, question here that we have for you, in the early 2000s, you moved down to Sarasota. Um, you were heavily... Uh, involved in in getting the Baltimore Orioles down into Sarasota for their for their spring training facility, and then most recently the Atlanta Braves over in Northport. Talk a little bit about that experience getting those clubs down there. The Reds uh, the Reds chose to leave. I think the the wife of uh, of the chairman of the board fell in love with Arizona, and so the Reds were at the end of uh, their uh, uh, contract and they chose to leave and we were in a situation, it provides today, not then, it provides today about 90, 91 million or between 83 and 90 million in tourism revenue down here, even for that short period of time and especially more with a farm team like the Pirates. Um, but so we were in a, a, a situation where uh, we had no team. Uh, we had an antiquated state and everything like that. And a couple of the county commissioners and I have become friendly and they knew that I had a background with the Baltimore Orioles, uh, even before uh, the present ownership uh, from 1960, when I, when I thought I was a pretty good third baseman. And they had one, by the way, and he played for 23 years, uh, making the right decisions in life. Uh, so um, I got involved as a resident uh, with the management in uh, helping put that together. And what it came down to here that most people don't know is we had shot at two teams. We had a shot at the Orioles and we had a shot at the Red Sox. And the Red Sox were looking for about 78 million, 79 million, and the Orioles were 30.1 million, each for a 30 year contract. So we chose the Orioles. And the uh, great trivia about this is uh, the Orioles brought in Janet Marie Smith, who's in the Hall of Fame. Janet Marie Smith is a genius. She designed Camden Yards. She's the one who understood that we wanted to go to a baseball park, not a cookie cutter stadium with a baseball field in it. 
And so they brought Janet Marie Smith down and she turned Ed Smith into a beautiful, beautiful thing. A little more of the trivia. When she finished that, she went up to the Red Sox and she's the one who put the seats on top of the green monster. And when she finished that, she went down to uh, Atlanta and converted uh, Olympic Stadium for the Braves. And for the past three and a half years, she's been vice president of the Dodgers. And yesterday she was named executive vice president of the Dodgers. She's been working at Chavez Ravine. But anyhow, they, we, uh, I'm pretty friendly with her. I'm gonna be with her. Uh, the Red Sox have moved their AAA farm team after 50 years in, Pro in Pawtucket, the Port Sox. They're moving them to Worcester, uh, which is a town a little while away. And Janet Marie is involved in building the stadium for him. And uh, we've remained friendly. I, I was not, she, I recorded the time that she was here just as a friend and everything else. And uh, so uh, Patty and I will be at the opening of the Woo Sox Stadium in, in Worcester. And um, one interesting trivial part about this Oriole thing for 30 years, and then I'll talk about the Braves for a second. But uh, Janet Marie had everything, uh, anybody who had wore an Oriole uniform was at the opening at Camden Yards in 92. We actually had a road race, five mile road race the, uh, the day before from Memorial Stadium to center field. And we sat on a bench in Camden Yards before uh, Rick Sutcliffe threw a picture. Uh, um, but uh, uh, Janet Marie had everything from the opening at Camden Yards except the ticket. And Patty and I glass and closed the ticket and gave it to her. And that sits on her desk. And the other thing about that too, is when she took the job with the Dodgers, I glass enclosed a Brooklyn Dodger 1955 scorecard, gave it to her. It sits in her office. And she sent me a picture of Tommy Lasorda holding the score, holding this thing, asking her, where the hell did she get this 1955 scorecard? So we, anyhow, we negotiated the Red Sox are a little too expensive. We negotiated the Orioles and it wound up as a nice relationship. In the last two and a half years, the county, and they had some executives in the county and the Atlanta Braves, uh, the Braves wanted out of the East Coast. They wanted to come to the West Coast with us. And uh, we negotiated that and uh, they now have a beautiful stadium, cool today stadium down there. The stadium, the difference in that stadium from Ed Smith Stadium is it's open all year. There's a bar, there's a restaurant and they have concerts and everything like that but it's a beautiful facility. And at the opening last year, all of us involved were at the opening. Uh, it's great to see a baseball game and everything like that. But in the fifth inning, they wheeled out Henry Aaron and they put the camera on him and the place went bananas. On the, on the outside of the stadium, they copied the Red Sox on this. I married a girl from Boston. The marriage is so doomed, it's ridiculous. Uh, on the outside of the stadium, well, I've got a picture of her in front of the number nine down at Fort Myers. On the outside of the stadium, they put these gigantic numbers, they're all photo ops, and everybody in the world goes in front of the 44 and they take the pictures in front of the 44. They're 12 feet high, okay? They're huge. So we got the Braves down there for 30 years now, too. That's awesome. Norm, this was all very interesting information that, that you shared with us. We know you're heavily involved um, in the tourism industry down in Florida. So thank you for sharing the, those experiences. Um, and we know you're an avid Brooklyn Dodger fan. You, you recently got me connected on that Facebook group that you were mentioning. So um, I do know that by following that Brooklyn Dodger fans are special. They are passionate about their Brooklyn Dodgers and they'll never forget those memories they have. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Al, can, Al, can I answer one, uh, add one thing quickly? Absolutely. Uh, the, 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 the worst day in Brooklyn Dodger history is October 13th, nine, October 3rd, 1951, Bobby Thompson. Uh, and there is, uh, and the greatest day is of 1955, Johnny Padres. Well, but there is a movie called Miracle Ball, which was on Discovery Channel and everything made by Brian Beagle, who's an ESPN reporter. And they were doing the research for Miracle Ball. That, that ball that Bobby Thompson hit is probably the most valuable baseball in the history of the world, other than the one for the, for the Cubs a couple of years ago. Uh, and they were headed in a direction to find that baseball. And I read, I was in New York in my place in New York, and I read a, a, a thing that they were doing research on this ball, but they were going the wrong way. So I called them. There was a book written by a guy named Tommy Holmes, not the ball player, from the Brooklyn Eagle. He's the only reporter after that happened 
that walked out to the left field stands. Everybody else went on the field and got the name of the woman who caught it. And so I called Brian Beagle, who was going the wrong way, gave her the name, and I actually still have the book. And I gave him the book and movies, a fabulous movie. It's usually played during the playoffs on Discovery and stuff like that. But we got him in the right direction where to find the ball that Bobby Thompson hit. That's awesome. Of course, of course he knew what pitch was coming. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, Norm, this is fantastic. It's always great catching up with you. And, and thank you again so much for coming on with us today and sharing some of your stories around the sports industry. My pleasure. And, and be free to call me at any time, please. Thank you, Norm. Thank you. Thank you.